A royal wedding is a special day for all involved. But do you know the rules the royals are forced to follow? And who, every now and again, has been known to break them? Keep watching to find out more. Marrying into the royal family isn't something that's taken lightly by the British monarchy. And before you even think of tying the knot, there's one person whose blessing you have to lock down. The Royal Marriages Act of 1772 decrees that all members of the monarchy must request the reigning sovereign's permission before proposing marriage, in writing no less. If the crowned head says no, all wedding bets are off. The only way around this rule is if the rejected royal goes rogue and becomes a commoner, giving up their privileges, status, public income, and inherited assets, along with relinquishing any potential future claims to the throne. The act was repealed in 2015, however, making it no longer a mandated requirement under British law to be granted permission to wed. However, the firm still enforces a strict rule that family members must request the Queen's blessing to marry, but only the important ones. Lesser royals, such as Princess Eugenie, who's ninth in line to the throne, are free to marry whoever their heart desires. Eugenie, the daughter of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, chose to wed her distant cousin Jack Brooksbank in 2018. When Henry VIII became king, England was a devout Catholic country. However, that all changed after Pope Clement VII refused multiple requests by the king to annul his marriage to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The King of England was still determined to make a marital upgrade, come hell or holy high water, however. So he decided to upend the entire country's religious status quo in order to get what he wanted. Henry created the Church of England, promptly declared himself the supreme head honcho granted himself a divorce, and married his mistress, Anne Boleyn. Any peasants who dared to object were burned at the stake or hanged, drawn and quartered, while noble detractors were simply beheaded. England was never to return to the Church of Rome, aside from a brief period during the rule of the Catholic Queen Mary. To ensure the future of the Church of England, royals were quickly forbidden from marrying Catholics, and it took until 2015 for the law to be changed. However, although royals can now marry members of the Catholic Church, any offspring who enter their religion are forbidden from inheriting the throne. All royal brides abide by a dress code. For one, picking a white gown is a must. All white with no color accents. This color mandate traces back to 1840, when Queen Victoria tied the knot with Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. However, Wallace Simpson broke the rule in 1937, choosing to wear a blue column dress for her marriage to then heir to the throne, Prince Edward. Then again, they weren't exactly keeping to any rules at the time. A local British fashionista must also design and make the gown to reflect the bride's respect for queen and country. In addition, low necklines are frowned upon, Dresses must cover the shoulders and be full length, and even showing off knees is a no-no. And, just to be sure that all rules are followed to the T, the queen must grant her approval before the gown can even start being made. But that's not all. The bride must also wear a tiara, and, unsurprisingly, that comes with its own set of rules, too. It's mandatory to make an appointment with the queen to select a tiara from her extensive coronet collection. Even then, options are limited, as the queen usually picks out the ones she deems suitable for the bride to choose from. Royal grooms are also heavily regulated when it comes to their choice of wedding attire. It has become a tradition for any male born within the firm's inner sanctuary to wear a military uniform for the ceremony. This is because the monarchy maintains close ties with the armed forces, with all of the queen's male offspring performing at least one term of military service during their lives. For example, Prince Charles served in the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy, while Prince Andrew was in the Royal Navy for 22 years and served during the Falklands War, which apparently resulted in this. I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. Meanwhile, Prince Edward chose to enter the Royal Marines, albeit only for a brief stint. Prince William underwent training with the Royal Navy and the British Army before joining the RAF and serving as a search and rescue pilot for three years. Finally, Prince Harry underwent two tours of Afghanistan during his 10-year stint in the British Army. Royal grooms are kitted out by Savile Rows, Jeeves and Hawks. The luxury tailors have been making the monarchy's male members' wedding uniforms and formal attire for centuries having been granted the status of being the official supplier to the crown by King George III back in the 1700s. 
Being invited to a wedding is always the perfect excuse to splash out for a fab new outfit. However, if you happen to be one of the privileged elite who's been invited to attend a wedding hosted by the royals, you'd better choose that outfit carefully. All royal wedding guests are subjected to strict rules concerning the dress code. For example, it's compulsory for women to wear a hat. And not just any old hat. Ludicrous and over-the-top are the millinery order of the day. Meanwhile, good tailoring and long hemlines are key aspects of women's dresses but they can be of any color aside from black or white, and the brighter, the better. Male guests don't escape the royal wedding rules either. Gentlemen are ordered to wear military uniforms, lounge attire, or morning dress. In case you're wondering, lounge attire means tailored, dark-colored business-style suits, while morning dress comprises a suit with tails. Even the royal wedding bouquet is subject to strict rules that must be followed. The bride-to-be is granted the freedom of deciding what kind of blooms she carries down the aisle, usually involving flowers that hold some sentimental value. But that's where the freedom ends. Royal wedding rules dictate that sprigs of myrtle must be inserted into all bridal bouquets. This green shrub with fragrant white flowers grows throughout the southern regions of England. Although its use as a decoration long predates Britain's monarchy. The ancient Greeks, for example, incorporated sprigs into wreaths and other decorations as a sacred symbol of love. Queen Victoria's daughter, Victoria, Princess Royal, was the first to include myrtle in her bouquet when she married Prince Friedrich Wilhelm of Prussia in 1858, and it has been a mandatory staple of royal bouquets ever since. Each bride's sprig is picked from the same myrtle plant that Queen Victoria was given by Prince Albert's grandmother. Following the ceremony, the flowers are taken and laid on the grave of the unknown warrior, which is located inside Westminster Abbey. The tradition dates back to 1923, when Queen Elizabeth II's mother married the future British king, George VI. The elder Elizabeth left her bouquet on the grave in honor of her brother, Fergus, who died during World War I. The royals are allowed free reign for engagement rings, just so long as they come from a crown-approved jeweler. A royal's every move is usually controlled by strict rules to ensure they don't fall short of the family's high standards. So it's little surprise that more rebellious decisions often result in serious disapproval. After Prince Charles proposed to Lady Diana Spencer, he presented her with a range of Garrard engagement rings to choose from. She settled on a white gold band with a 12-carat oval sapphire fire and 14 diamonds. The ring is iconic and beloved by many, especially since it later became Kate Middleton's. But when it came to the Queen, one was not amused by Diana's selection. Royal feathers were reportedly ruffled because the ring wasn't bespoke. It even featured in a Garrard catalog, meaning any old commoner could buy the same one, if they had $60,000 going spare, that is. Preventing similar indignities and humiliations from occurring, other rules are firmly in place when it comes to the bride's royal wedding ring. For example, all bridal wedding bands must be made from Welsh gold, a tradition dating back to 1923, when the Queen Mother married the future King George VI. The same nugget of gold used to make the Queen Mother's ring was also crafted into the wedding bands for Princess Margaret, Princess Anne, and Princess Diana, before presumably there was nothing left. The royal family is most definitely not just like us, as it's pretty safe to say that most ordinary people don't own castles, palaces, and actual crown jewels. Very un unwieldy. And there are certain wedding traditions that, despite being commonplace to many, are usually eschewed by the royals. It's traditional for male members of the hoi polloi to have a best man by their side on their wedding day. The best man plays an essential role in normal wedding ceremonies, but the royal family have mostly done away with this particular title. Instead, the groom-to-be has what are known as supporters. The groom's supporters basically act in the exact same capacity as a best man, just with a slightly posher title. However, However, one royal who broke this rule was the usually reliably conservative future King of the United Kingdom, Prince William. During his wedding, William threw caution to the wind and named his younger brother, Prince Harry, as his official best man for his and Kate Middleton's nuptials. 
Everything about the actual royal wedding day is regulated and run like a military operation. Included among the many protocols, conventions, and customs that must be adhered to are rules about what time the ceremony occurs and how many receptions accompany it. Royal weddings are conducted early in the day, with most of them kicking off at noon, and the ceremony is followed by a total of two receptions. The newlyweds are first whisked away in a horse-drawn carriage, followed by the obligatory balcony-waving photo op, after which they join their guests at the first soiree, which is officially called a wedding breakfast, even though it takes place in the afternoon. The 600 guests who attended Meghan and Harry's wedding breakfast of champions were reportedly served champagne with canapes and bowl food. The second reception is a more intimate affair, allowing the happy couple to really let loose, by royal standards at least. It occurs in the evening and is attended by family and close friends. A formal three-course dinner is served, the obligatory speeches are made, and a fireworks display rounds off the festivities. Weddings don't come cheap, of course. Bridebook estimates an average Brit's run-of-the-mill wedding costs in the region of £24,000, which equates to approximately $32,000. For obvious reasons, a royal wedding is much, much more expensive. William and Kate's big day back in 2011 cost around $34 million, while Harry and Meghan's 2018 nuptials upped the ante to somewhere in the $42.2 million range. The British monarchy has actually scaled down on expenses these days, as unbelievable as that may seem. ABC News estimates that, after adjusting for inflation, Charles and Diana's 1981 wedding would cost an eye-watering $110 million in today's terms. However, scaled down or not, a royal wedding will always be spendy, and tradition dictates that the monarchy picks up the check. Although, in reality, that's not the case at all. In a statement prior to Meghan and Harry's wedding, Kensington Palace announced, the royal family will pay for the core aspects of the wedding, such as the church service, the associated music, flowers, decorations, and the reception. But this left the vast bulk of expenses uncovered. Not surprisingly, the royal family has kept shtum on the subject. But according to Bridebook, the security bill for their wedding would have been even higher than the $39.7 million bill served to William and Kate. And that part is paid in full by the British public. Talk about a generous spirit. Boom. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite royals are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.